This is The Resilient Life, where we believe that every human will struggle in this life. Our challenge is to struggle well. I'm Ryan Mannion. I lost my brother to war, my mom to cancer, and I'm the daughter of a retired Marine. I'm also a wife, mom, author, and president of one of the nation's leading veteran service organizations. Join me and some incredible guests as we explore the value of struggling well through life's inevitable challenges. Okay, well, I am really excited for today's guest on the Resilient Life podcast. Joining us today is Gary Sinise of the Gary Sinise Foundation, incredible uh, veteran service organization, and also uh, most fondly known as Lieutenant Dan from Forrest Gump. Uh, Gary, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Ryan. Good, good to be with you. Yeah, so I have to I have to start with a story. Um, you know, my dad is a retired colonel in the Marine Corps, uh, and um, when Forrest Gump came out, uh, I uh, clearly remember uh, my parents saying, we're going to go see this movie together as a family. So it was myself, my brother, my mom and dad. My dad was stationed at the Pentagon at the time, and, you know, I mean— the movie was being talked about from the first person that saw it. You, you knew it was going to be an iconic movie. And my dad brought the entire family. We went and watched that movie. And it was probably one of the first times that my parents brought us to, I would say, more like an adult movie, right? And a movie <laughs> that, that wasn't geared towards us, but a movie they felt that was important for us to see. And I remember feeling, you know, pretty changed from from watching that movie, even being a military child, um, I didn't have full grasp or understanding of service members and, and, you know, some of the hardships that they went through. And, and I remember watching that movie and, um, and just feeling differently about my role as a military child and the role that my dad, uh, was in as a, a Marine Corps officer. And so, I want to I want to thank you for your contribution to that incredible film that I have since passed down to my children to say you need to watch this movie. Uh, it's an important movie that you know uh, it's an important movie to our country, um, and and you need to see it. And then you know I want to thank you for I, I was looking back and I shared this with you before we hopped on. Um, you actually uh, coming full circle, you know, that was in 94, I think, when Forrest Gump came out. Is that correct? Yes. And did. then, you know, and then we lost Travis um, in 2007 uh, in Iraq and um, started the Travis Manning Foundation. And when, when we were growing and maturing, um, we said, you know, we really have to do a video about the work that we're doing here. And, um, and somebody in passing had said, well, you know, it's always great to have like a voiceover or, or somebody as with celebrity status kind of sharing the work you're doing. And I remember my dad saying like, wouldn't it be great if we could get Gary Sinise? And uh, lo and behold, you volunteered your time. Uh, I was able to fly uh, out to LA on the set with you. And um, I think there were like fake cadaver bodies on the side as you were recording <laughs> your, your, your uh, I remember I have this picture. We set it all up over yeah. here on the <laughs> yeah. side of the soundstage and, and uh, yeah. And, and it was, it was such a incredible experience uh, for me because um you know, we were certainly struggling those first couple years after losing Travis. And, um, and when we started to come to this point where we were feeling very purposeful in what we were doing in his name, and then to have someone like you come on and, you know, really, um, uh, give us some gravitas, uh, to our work. Um, it, it was a big deal. Uh, we debuted that video and it was like, whoa, Gary Sinise is speaking on behalf of the Travis Mannion Foundation. So, um, so I don't know if I ever properly thanked you for how um, impactful and important uh, that five minute video was. And uh, you know, I, again, I looked at it today before I joined you. I'm like, I got to go back and watch that video. Um, and you know, a lot of the things you talked about still ring true to the work we're doing today. So, um, 
So I thank you for well, that. Like I said, you have to you have to send that to me. I will. I will <laughs> certainly do that. Um, it's a good memory, and I'm I'm you know I was I was of course humbled and and honored and uh, grateful that I could support what you were what you were working on and what you were building in in Travis's name. It, uh, it's important stuff, you know these these nonprofits that are in this space helping in various areas. I mean, just consider, uh, consider the veteran space without all the nonprofits that are out there that are, that are helping across the country in multiple areas. Mm -hmm. If you took all those nonprofits away, I mean, just, just imagine, uh, the, the catastrophe we'd have in the veteran space. I mean, it's, it's hard enough, you know, for veterans to get the support they need and, and everything, uh, if they're just relying on the government and, and we can't be relying on the government. We have to take charge and, and try to do something. And when someone like you, a family like yours has a loss like that, and you take that loss and you turn it into something positive that will help uh, other people in Travis's name, you honor his legacy and you honor his service and and you continue to serve yourself. So, So for me, it was a, a no-brainer to be able to, to step forward and help you. Well, I appreciate that. And, and you know, one of the things that I love about everything that you represent is that, you know, you were you gladly stepped forward to help us spread the word of the work that we're doing. And, um, you know, you've talked a lot about the role that you played as Lieutenant Dan in Forrest Gump, but I... I don't know a better way to say this, but you kind of put your money where your mouth is. Like you got in the weeds, you got in the dirt, you started the Gary Sinise Foundation and you're joining right alongside all of these incredible organizations with your own, um, doing incredible work. And so uh, I'd love to know kind of, let's start at the beginning because I, I've heard you talk about this before, but I want to make sure that, that everybody hears the story of kind of how you were so affected and, and what playing that role um, did for you. Of course, you come from a military background yourself. Um, there's definitely some great uh, service in your lineage, but you've, you've talked before about how transformational that role was and, and, and how it shaped kind of what you did next in your life. So just walk us down that a little bit um, and, and share a little bit more about that. Yeah, I think Ryan, the, the, the Lieutenant Dan part was a, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Remember Lieutenant Dan talks about his destiny and you know, he's got, he, he's, he makes a big thing about, uh, about, you know, fo- following his family's footsteps of all this service. And you remember the funny little shot in the movie where you see his, his revolutionary war relative and then his, you know, his civil war and then the world war one and then world war two, all these relatives and he, his family line and his destiny was to, you know, either be a great military leader or, or, and to go on have a, a superb military career, a long, long career. Uh, Lieutenant Dan wanted a military career. That's what he wanted to do. Or he was going to die honorably in battle alongside his fellow service members and what happens to him of course is that Forrest pulls him out <laughs> pulls him out of that uh, and saves his life and he's resentful because he's very very guilty about what happened that day he's the lieutenant in charge of his platoon and he walks him into an ambush and a bunch of guys get killed and a bunch of guys get hurt and he doesn't feel that he deserves to, to, to go on. And so he's very resentful and bitter and angry. And, and of course, it's all happening within the context of the Vietnam War, which was a time when, uh, you know, many of my, uh, you know, family members served and were, um, you know, came back to a nation that was totally uh, divided over whether that service was, was honorable or not. And uh, so many of them, our Vietnam veterans, just went into the shadows. And it was a very, very difficult time for our services. And Lieutenant Dan, of course, is, is a guy who's not only living with his injuries and his, his post-traumatic stress and his guilt, 
but he's living uh, within a time where, where the nation turned its back on our veterans. Uh, but, you know, what I love about that story, and it's a short little story if you look at it, it's only t- probably 10, 20 minutes of the movie, you know, these little sections, but it's so positive and it's so unique in terms of what happened to our Vietnam veterans. And, 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 and it was something new with regards to the movie business and Vietnam veterans at the time it came out in 1994. Prior to that, if you look at the movies that came out about Vietnam veterans, uh, casualties of war, apocalypse now, platoon, uh, you name it, they're, you know, uh, deer hunter, uh, you look at these films that had come out coming home and you always, you always had the feeling that the veteran was just not going to be all right at the end of the film. Right. You know, they were struggling and they were suffering and they were uh, really dealing with a lot of bad stuff. And they, you know, were they going to be able to carry on uh, with their lives and Forrest Gump comes along and what happens to Lieutenant Dan? He's angry. He's mad. He's living uh, by himself. He's mad at everything. But in the end, he's standing up again on new legs. He's a wealthy businessman. He's married and he's pushing forward with his life. And it's a positive ending to a story um, that we want for every single service member coming back from war. So I think it really resonated. And it certainly became a story that I could carry into the hospitals with me when I was going to talk to, to our new generation of Lieutenant Dan's and and so many of them would want to talk about that story. And so many of them deserve and want that ending. You know, they're wounded, they're broken, but they want to know that they're going to move forward and be okay. And that's, that's the cool thing about that movie. Uh, absolutely. And I know, you know, one of the things that I had pointed out is uh, one of the scenes uh, in that movie where Lieutenant Dan's back home, he's in the wheelchair it's on, at New Year's Eve. And, you know, kind of everything's happening around him. Everyone's enjoying themselves and, you know, um, but he's not like super present in that moment. And, you know, you think about that and, and a lot of those, a lot of those images, a lot of those things that, that those themes that are brought up around Lieutenant Dam are just, like you said, they're just so, um, focal to what's happening here today and making sure I, I just actually, um, interviewed, uh, Kirstie Ennis, uh, uh, an incredible, um, Marine that, um, was injured in, uh, Afghanistan, lost her leg and a lot of other, um, terrible injuries that she suffered. And, and we had a whole conversation, not around her physical injuries, but her mental injuries. And, you know, at, at the one, on her one year anniversary of her injury, she tried to kill herself. And, um, and she's doing incredible today. She's an incredible advocate uh, and she's come full circle, but it's those invisible wounds of war um, that are, are super afflicting uh, to our service members and, um, and especially those that are suffering physical injuries. And, um, you know, they, they have so many challenges ahead of them. Um, and you have made it uh, a mission to help with, those challenges uh, through the Gary Sidis Foundation. You guys are doing incredible work. In fact, um, one of our our show producers, um, uh, as she was kind of, she knew you were coming on and she was looking up, she said, oh my gosh, the Gary Sidis Foundation, she's the uh, spouse of a, a, a service member in the Navy. And she said, the Gary Sinise Foundation actually um, provided a home to one of our very best friends. So, um, you know, just an, an awesome connection there, but tell us about the Gary Sinise foundation. Tell us about the incredible work that you're doing. Well, thank you. Um, uh, you know, as we were talking about the, the importance of the nonprofits, uh, in our, our, our work that we, we all do and the, the space we're in here to help folks, um, that that became like doing that PSA for for you early on in your work. That was right. Just that was just part of what I was doing way back then. I, um, I it was it was important to me to try to help as many 
folks as I could within the military space. And the and and a way that I found that I could do that was by supporting these nonprofits, these military support nonprofits out there. So I was doing all kinds of support work for numerous military uh, charities, many that you know, and, you know, they're all listed on our, our website of, of things that I support in the past. And that, th- all that work was just a way that I could, uh, you know, just do more, you know, um, by helping other people do more. So when I, when it came to like, okay, well, how do I do more than that? <laughs> It, it's, it was, well, I'll start one of those too. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll start, I'll start my own uh, nonprofit. It's clear and clear that I'm in this world and yep. I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying in it. And, uh, you know, but, but how, how much can I actually run around the country and do all these events for all these nonprofits all the time? Uh, I think I need to consolidate in some way and bring all the, you know, bring the, the work that I'd been doing over the years kind of together under, under one umbrella and make the most of it yep. because uh, I had, I had kind of developed a pretty good uh, relationship with a lot of the military and a lot of the nonprofits and, and uh, all of that. And I thought, well, uh, let's, let's make the most of that. So what did I do? Um, I named the gap, the, the foundation, the Gary Sinise foundation. Why did I do that? Well, because, you know, why didn't I call it the help the troops foundation or something? Um, because, because by the time I started my own foundation, I'd already been doing this for, for a number of years, going back to the nineties with the disabled American veterans. And so there was a, there was a strong trust, trusted relationship between me and the military and between me and, and the people that I'd been, uh, supporting in the nonprofit space and the, and the, and the American people who I was asking to go support the Travis Mannion foundation or support the, you know, the, the, you know, what a Fisher house or whatever it was, you know, raising a lot of money for those. So I developed a pretty strong, reliable uh, relationship within the space. And I thought, let's capitalize on it. The brand is pretty good already. Let's, let's call it the Gary Sneeze foundation, which I did. And we just celebrated our 10 year, uh, anniversary just um, just this past past June, doing awesome. a lot of good good work out there. So tell us a little bit. Give us uh, the background because through the foundation, you have gifted several beautiful, accessible smart homes to wounded veterans, and and you actually um, attend a lot of these homecoming ceremonies where service members go into their homes for the first time. Uh, tell us about number one. What made you recognize that specifically as a need, that that wanted to be your line of focus? And then number two, um, how are those experiences for you? Yeah, that uh, that started um, in 2009. Um, remember Brendan Morocco. Uh, Brendan was a soldier who was blown up in Iraq, and he was the first... Uh, soldiers to survive a quadruple amputation, both his arms and both his legs. And I saw him in a hospital in uh, April of 2009. And then, uh, and he's from Staten Island. And I was shooting CSI New York um, in New York shortly after that, not too long after that. And the commissioner of the fire department there at the time, it, it was Sal Cassano and I knew them because I had supported a bunch of 9-11 uh, firefighter stuff and, in New York and was supporting different organizations there. And they came to me on the set and said, look, we want to we want to build a special house for this Staten Island soldier who got blown up. Uh, he lost both his arms and both his legs. And I said, I know who you're talking about. I saw him in the hospital recently. And so I offered to do a concert to raise money. And so I brought my band, you know, the Lieutenant Dan band over to, um, to we did the concert at the St. George's Theater in Staten Island. And Brendan was there and, you know, we sold it out with New Yorkers coming in to support one of their own. And we raised a whole bunch of money and built this special house. And while we were, get, while we were preparing to, to set that concert up, 
there was another quadruple amputee who came to the hospital. Uh, and he was a Marine a guy named uh, Todd Nicely. And Todd uh, lost both his arms and both his legs. And so I said, well, holy cow, we, we're going to have to do another concert. <laughs> I did another concert and we raised money to build another house. And that, that's how I got into it. And then and after I started, that was before my foundation. And then after I started the foundation, we wanted to continue that work. Yep. So we created a program called Rise, Restoring Independence, Supporting Empowerment. And uh, continued building houses, hired builders who are our builders. We, we pay them and, and they uh, have now done gosh, I don't know, 60 or 70 houses for us in the last uh, several years, probably uh, probably the last eight years wow. or so. And so, so tell us about that experience when you get to see these service members, a lot of them with families, you know, be able to walk into their, their new home, accessible home for the first time. It's, it's got to be pretty overwhelming. Well, it's, it's beautiful. I mean, to see that they, they, man, these are mortgage free houses. So, uh, you know, we provide everything and, and, uh, they don't have to pay for it at all. So that's a big, like load off the shoulders, especially if you're, you know, somebody who's very severely wounded, wondering how they're going to support their family. They got kids again, you know, how are they going to do it? You know? Uh, they're living in a space that's not built for somebody with uh, severe uh, injuries or disabilities. So they're navigating their way through the hallways and trying to figure out how to get in the bathroom and all, all this stuff. It's very difficult. So these, all these houses are especially designed specifically for each one of these service members. So it makes their life and the life of their family uh, so much, so much easier to manage, you know, in these houses that are specifically built just to accommodate their needs. Uh, and that's, that's a big stress reliever right there. And the, the important thing is, you know, you have various injuries, so, you know, we've, we've got a lot of different folks. Some, some are in a total caregiving mode where they cannot take care of themselves. Right. They don't have, you know, they're, they're, they've got a traumatic brain injury. They've got a, uh, you know, they, they suffered a stroke or whatever it is, and they are just at, you know, in the caregiver's hands. So we, we put a lot of equipment into these houses that can make, uh, make the life of the veteran and the caregivers uh, much more manageable. Uh, and that can, that can restore independence, not only to the service member, but to those family members as well. Uh, that can be life changing, you know. It's just it's just a life changing thing, and it's beautiful to see. And what's what's wonderful about the program is that we have so many in kind partners that come in and provide flooring and the roof and the plumbing and the you know all these different things. If you look at our website and you look up our Rise program on the, on the website, you'll see just so many different wonderful organizations and individuals and 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 nonprofits who support us and, and whatnot. There's a lot that goes in, a lot of love goes into these houses. We're, we're just about to, you know, we have a, the halfway point of our, our, our home building. We do something called our walls of honor where we, the, the frame goes up, right? And it's before you put the drywall in. Uh -huh. So you've just got the wood frame and, and it's sort of the halfway point. And, we bring the service member in there. We bring the, the people that are helping to build the house. We bring the local community folks around the neighbors, whatever. And we, and we honor the, the service member and their family by allowing people that are working on the house or people that live in the neighborhood to just go up on those, on those walls, those wood frames and write messages. I love it. Yeah. To, to the, to, and we have one coming up uh, next week in Tennessee that we're, uh, we're doing and um, these messages then are, they live in the house and the drywall goes up, but within that house, that service member and those, those family members can look, they've looked at every single one of those messages that are written on the, on the frame of that house. And it's messages of support and gratitude, appreciation, love, you know, salute, tribute, whatever. 
uh, just appreciation. And within the walls of that house is honoring that service member. And uh, that that's very important. That's, that's, that's like the halfway point before they actually walk into the house. I've, I've actually, Ryan, I only attend the occasional home dedication because I, I, you know, I just made it a practice early on to let that, to let that moment be totally about, you know, the wounded soldier or Marine or whoever it is and their family and the spotlight totally on them. I've, I've, I've gone to a, a, a few here and there and there's videos on our website that, that have me in there, but generally I would, I like to go in later without all the cameras around and, you know, without all the celebration and everything and just let them uh, give me a tour and then sit down and have a little meal with them and, and just spend some quiet quality time and get a, get a private tour yeah. to see what we actually have done. I love that. We actually did something similar, um, you know, through our work with Gold Star Families. We do these expeditions and we take families of the fallen all across the world to do service expeditions. And, and uh, a few years ago, I was with a group uh, in Houston and we were doing a home rebuild for a family uh, after Harvey. And um, we did we did something very similar where the, you know, all the drywall had to be ripped out, new framing had to be put in. And um, and uh, it was the day before the new drywall was going up and all of these Gold Star families uh, wrote messages. Um, and before the drywall went up, the family that was living in that house was able to come in and read the stories of their loved ones. And they shared um, memories and stories about, um, you know, their their husbands, their sons, their daughters, their sisters, their brothers, and, um, you know, what an incredible way to to I think about that family who was a civilian family that had no connection to the military, and here they were, they had twenty Gold Star family members that were, you know, helping to muck out their house and rebuild the framing and the drywall, and they were so incredibly grateful and just overwhelmed that these people who had suffered so much were coming in to help them. Right. And That's beautiful. yeah. And I think about that family a lot and I think, you know, gosh, you know, when, she, cause a, a lot of it was primarily in their living room and kitchen on the first floor. And I think, you know, every time they must pass by, they have to think about these, these notes that are written on, on the wood frames underneath the drywall. Um, so I, I know, I know how that, you know, I know the, the, the meaning behind something like that. I was a part of it myself and it's, uh, it's pretty awesome. Um, I'd love to kind of get a dive in, um, here quickly and just hear your thoughts. You know, we're at a pivotal time right now. Um, just, uh, a little bit ago, our, our president declared an end to 20 years in Afghanistan and, and effectively an end to, uh, the, the wars, um, over the last 20 years. Um, we had the 20th anniversary of nine 11 and, um, and I know within our community, we have a lot of veterans and, and gold star family members that, um, we want to impress upon them that no matter what their service mattered, um, a lot of them are feeling confused. They're feeling, um, they're feeling a lot of things. Um, and so, I just would love to kind of get your thoughts on what we can do as a community to make sure, because what I've always said is, you know, one of the things that's so important outside of the support and, you know, programs that the Gary Sinise Foundation offers, the Travis Manning Foundation offers, and all of these other nonprofits, the other thing that is so incredibly important about our organizations is that we continue to shed the light on this community, um, this 1%. That, um, that, that steps up and serves. And, um, and as we walk away from, uh, the conflict over the last 20 years, what does that mean, uh, to our nation, to these men and women? And, and what do we need to be doing to make sure that we're putting it back into the, the hearts and minds of, um, the 99%, um, that don't have that connection to the military? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you don't have a personal connection to somebody who's serving either a friend or a family member, you're kind of disconnected <laughs> to it. Yeah. You know, I, I found that as a, as a public figure, 
uh, one of the ways that I could uh, be of service was was by exactly that, you know, shining a light and and drawing attention and creating awareness and telling stories of the people that I would uh, interact with within the military community, uh, the, the the hospitals, the war zones, wherever. I would always um, try to find a way to um, to describe and to to uh, you know tell the american people and the and the public uh, some who knew and some who don't don't know what military life is like what our service members are actually doing out there um you know having been to the war zones and and you know walk walk those areas uh with our troops and everything uh seeing them uh, serving honorably and uh, it was always a motivated motivating factor for me to come back and try to to make sure the American people don't forget you know just just don't forget somebody's out there whether they're on the front page or not you know they're uh, they're out there and they're serving and it's a particularly difficult time right now having uh, having 20 years go by and the, 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 the Taliban is in power again after 20 years. Uh, difficult for our service members to kind of digest and process, you know, well, you know, certainly many of them are, are uh, questioning uh, what, what they did and why they did it. Um, but um, at, at, at the same time, you know, there was, there was so much, that happened there for for this for the the people and so much that happened uh, in Afghanistan to prevent anything from happening here yeah. again. That um, we should never lose sight, uh, sight of that. Uh, um, you know, I, I I mean I remember one of my trips, uh, Ryan, uh, and I was uh, in Afghanistan and. I walked through one of our hospitals, you know, it was kind of made, just makeshift hospital. And our doctors had just come out of a brain surgery in one of these makeshift hospitals where they operated on a small, uh, a young girl who the Russians left a lot of weaponry there, right? when they left and they left a lot of, they had uh, these mines that were designed to sort of look like toys and they were all over the country. And, and so a young child seeing one of those things thinks it's a toy. And this young girl had, you know, blown up and it, and our doctors were operating on her brain. And I, I walked in right after they got done doing this and they saved this young Afghan girl's life. Um, so, so, so should that service member who is a military doctor look at what happened in just the last couple of weeks and say, my service didn't matter? Right. Of course his service man. You know, it, it mattered to that family that he saved that young girl's life. And, and there are countless stories like that uh, where just the human being to human being contact and support um, mattered and made a difference, you know, in somebody's life. And, and uh, you know, of course, we know that uh, schools were built and, millions of Afghan women and, and girls got to go to school that they, uh, they wouldn't have experienced in the last 20 years. What, what has happened, you know, uh, with our, with our leadership and the way this whole thing uh, happened, that's, that's something that is really out of the control of the, of the service member. Right. You know, when you volunteer to serve our country, you you go where they tell you and you do your duty mm -hmm. and you do your job. I had um, uh, I had actually just posted on um, on my on my Instagram the other day. I had found a 
quote from Travis when he was on his first deployment to Iraq. He was interviewed by the Philadelphia Inquirer while in country. They had called him and um, they were asking him questions around, you know, what was happening there. And and, I, and I'll paraphrase, but he, he said something along the lines of, you know, I don't think that the average American sees um, – the incredible things that are happening over here every day from our servicemen and women. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, these servicemen and women will act on whatever our leadership decides. They're, they're here and they're ready to, to take on the mission that is set forth by our leadership. And so, you know, these little pieces of humanity, these stories that, that you share, you know, I think that's what, that's what our general public doesn't get to see. And um, and that's why it's very hard for them to conceptualize um, what was happening over there the last 20 years, right? Um, they looked at it as, as this endless war, um, where in fact it was keeping the enemy from our door right here at home, and it was um, continuing to provide um, that safety and support to our Afghans um, and, and, and our Afghan allies. And so... Um, I feel, I feel a personal responsibility to make sure that every veteran that I'm speaking to, every gold star family I come into contact with, I, I let them know how much their service mattered. Let these families know that their loved one's service, though they didn't make it back, was not in vain. Um, and, um, I think it becomes a personal responsibility for all of us within this community, um, to make sure that we're leading that charge, you know, uh, especially. Well, I know, I, I know you know this already, but but that makes a big difference. You know, it ma- it makes a big difference. I, I'm, I, you know, I'm, I've seen it too many times. I mean, just that little pat on the back, you know, can make a big difference. It can change somebody's day for the better. Yeah. And you never, you never know, you know, when when you see somebody in uniform, what, what kind of day they've been having, you know, maybe they just lost 10 friends, you know, and they're walking through the airport, like, you know, dealing with that and somebody coming up and patting them on the back and, and giving them a hug and saying, uh, I appreciate what you do. And, and I, I don't take it for granted that can, that can, that can turn their life uh, in a different direction that day. And, and uh, it could be very, very important. Yeah, absolutely. What do you think that other Americans could learn from our military? If there was one thing that you, over the course of um, the you know the years and the work that you've done within this community, if there's one thing that you wish the average American knew, um, I know there's so many, but if you could dial down on one thing, what would that be? Mm. Well, team teamwork, <laughs> you know, yeah. because I mean, you you know, well within the military, you know, you're you're um, you're only as good as the guy over here or the gal over here, you know, uh, the people around you, and uh, that's something that's very very impressive, you know, um, you know, I mean, it, look, people in the military, there's there's you know some some people that are really good, really honorable. There's some people that are not, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, they're human beings. Like every other group in, in in the world, right? right? They're they're, they're human beings. (laughs) But, but one thing that they're really, really taught, you know, is to work as a unit, you know, and that's important, Um, you know, and, and that can apply to any business, you know, that you're trying to create or, uh, team sport or anything like that. Um, I'm all, I've always been very, very impressed, uh, in the places that I've been allowed to go and the, the, you know, being embraced by the military community and the things I've been allowed to see just, uh, and the people I've, I've met, uh, just extraordinary, extraordinary people that inspire me and motivate me and, and have really, really impressed me. And that I've learned a great deal from, I mean, I, I suppose if years ago I would have had some bad experiences supporting the, the military, you know, maybe I would, wouldn't have kept going. But I just had nothing but I saw the, 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 the positive impact that you can make by just showing up 
And I saw what they did and I was impressed by it and they allowed me to see more. And, and so um, the one way that I could serve was going out there and, and going on television and telling people what I was witnessing as a, as a, as a civilian uh, who who was allowed into the military community. So very, very impressive uh, group of folks that I've I've had the, the opportunity to meet. Well, certainly I, I was looking through kind of, you have a lot of honorary, um, honorary, uh, I don't want to say it's not all degrees, but you know, you're an honorary Marine, you're an honorary, uh, uh, there was a, a laundry list I was looking <laughs> through. Um, uh, I, I, I pointed out and I, and I wanted to, to point out to you that you and I are both honorary graduates of, uh, the United States Naval Academy. So I, I was, a uh, in 2017, I was bestowed that honor and no That's matter great. what, I don't care if they ask me for a bio that has two sentences. I always say, no matter what, I want that in that bio because I'm so very proud of that distinction. Um, and, and I saw that, that you were a honorary graduate for the class of 2020. So, um, I, ne- I never went to college, so I was very <laughs> happy to get that honorary degree. There you go. <laughs> um, well, well, Gary, you know, I'm going to finish it up with our last question, but before I do, I want to thank you because, you know, again, going all the way back to our loss in 2007, um, it was really important for us to know that there were people, um, not just, you know, Travis's friends that he served in the Marine Corps with, or his friends from the Naval Academy or, you know, my dad's friends, we were part of a military community. So we were embraced by, um, our our own friends and family when we lost my brother, but it was individuals like you that, um, that stepped outside and stepped into a, 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 a community that you weren't connected with by your own service, um, and, and made it a mission, um, to make sure and bring light, uh, to these, to these voices, to these stories of service. And so uh, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful, um, for all that you do, all that you continue to do and all that I know you will do in the future. Um, I want to close it out with the last question I ask everyone who's a guest on the resilient life podcast. And, and that is, uh, what is living a resilient life look like for you? Um, <clears throat> well, there's a there's a chapter in my book. Um, I I wrote a book a couple of years ago called Grateful American, and I, I'm that I didn't know what I was going to call the book when I started, but as I as I was writing uh, these these themes of gratitude and appreciation just kept kind of coming out, and and and. Um, and this this chapter in the book is called Turning Point. And it, it is the September 11th chapter, and uh, you know I write about a lot the, a lot of things that happened prior to that, but I do point to that awful day 20 years ago as a uh, as a as a time where my heart was just just breaking and. And I needed something, you know, I needed to find a way to, to, uh, to help. And, um, and I found that service to others made, made me heal. And, uh, service can be a great healer, um, because we all have heartbreak and we all have challenges and we are, you know, people face cancer and people lose people. And, you know, I mean, bad things happen to human beings, you know, but what makes that, where, where is that resilient part of ourselves that, that uh, we can pull ourselves up and it usually has something to do with taking care of somebody else, you know, uh, reaching out and touching somebody else that is maybe having a worse day than you are or uh, that uh, needs real uh, support. And uh, I, I found that, uh, you know, a, a way that I could kind of find that resilient part of myself 
to carry on and to go forward during times of real challenge. And I write about them in some of those in my book was reaching out and touching somebody else. And, and, and I've found now I've, you know, I've been involved in it so much and, and I can't imagine life without, without that aspect of it. It just, you know, I'm, uh, I've had a great career. I've been blessed with acting and making money and, and, uh, you know, doing movies and, you know, all these things. We have heartbreak and real serious challenge within our family, but to have this foundation that is reaching out and touching people every single day and changing their lives, you know, helping to improve their lives, uh, helping to turn, you know, a negative into a positive that gives me, a lot of hope and, and carries me forward. So I always tell people service is a great healer. Um, you know, when, when, uh, uh, there, they, when, when joy, there's a line in my book, I think it's, it's when joy connects to mission, uh, a life's purpose begins to take shape. And that is, that is truly uh, uh, very, very accurate because I get a lot of joy out of that. You know, I mean, I, uh, I, I have been blessed in my life and I get a lot of joy out of, uh, uh, putting my hands on somebody else. He's, we have a lot of gold star families within our community that we serve and everything and just embracing those kids and trying to lift them up and seeing a wounded service member get a house or, you know, whatever it is that we're doing, firefighters are they're battling blazes all over and we're, we're giving them food, whatever it is, uh, it's helping somebody else. Service is a great healer and it can keep that resilient spirit going, uh, you know, within, within you to do, do a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. One of our, one of our early mottos at the foundation with the work we did with gold stars was honor the fallen by challenging the living. And, and that was really what That's we perfect, tried to yeah. do just, you know, <clears throat> to the best way to honor your loved one and to work through and, and is to be in service to others, to challenge yourself to do more. And, and we have found that a great healer, a great way to, to be resilient, to, um, grasp onto that post-traumatic growth as, as they're dealing with the challenges, um, and their life's changes. So, um, That's I, exactly, that's exactly what you've done is taken the terrible, terrible heartbreak of losing Travis and saying, well, well how do we process this? What are, what are we going to do? And we're going to start something in his name that is going to carry his spirit forward. Uh, he was a person who signed up to serve his country. Uh, you have to be somewhat, there has to be this, honorable sort of service aspect in, in your being when you do do that. It's a yeah. dangerous job. Uh, and, and he gave his life for his country and you've taken that and you have turned his legacy into something that's helping a lot of people. And I commend you for that. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate that. Uh, Gary, thank you so much for joining us today. For everyone out there, um, if you haven't seen Forrest Gump, go see it. If you haven't seen it in a while, go watch it again. If you have kids, uh, introduce them to the the movie and the story. Um, pick up the book, Grateful American, and learn more about the Gary Sinise Foundation. We will put the link to the foundation on our YouTube channel. Uh, thank you for joining us on the Resilient Life Podcast. Please make sure to like, subscribe, and share with your friends. Gary, thank you so much. God bless, Ryan. Thank you for having me.